All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, thank you everyone for joining in. It's so great to see so many people from all across the country. Um, so welcome to uh, the five tips to maximize your 2024 fundraising. Welcome to our webinar. Uh, my name is Lisa Galbrin. I'm the marketing and communications manager here at Mighty Cause. And I'm so excited to start talking about 2024 fundraising. All right, uh, just to talk through the agenda and some housekeeping. So we'll be going through uh, the five tips uh, regarding 2024 fundraising. At the end, we'll go through any questions and answers you may have. For any questions you have, please use the uh, go to, I mean, the Zoom uh, questions tool in your Zoom dashboard. If you add it in the chat, that may get lost and I may not be able to see it. So please add it there. Uh, if there's a time throughout the webinar, I will stop and answer some questions, but we'll also save some time at the end to answer any questions as well. Um, and as well, uh, if there are any issues, if you can't hear me, can't see something, please let me know. Um, just post into uh, the Q&A. That's the easiest way for me to see it there. All right. So uh, before we get into our five tips, just a little introduction into Mighty Cause for those of you who are not as familiar with Mighty Cause. We've been around since 2006. Uh, we were previously named Razu, um, and a couple years ago, uh, we uh, our name was changed to Mighty Cause. We're a year-round all-in-one fundraising platform for nonprofits. We're one of the largest giving day technology providers in the country as well. And we offer fundraising tools to help you for a single campaign or for year-round fundraising. So some of the tools that we provide that are available for nonprofits are peer-to-peer uh, -peer fundraising, integrations with Salesforce, MailChimp, um, you name it, Zapier, et cetera, uh, reporting and donor management tools, our own CRM system, et cetera. Um, so if you're interested after this webinar in um, receiving a demo or learning more about Mighty Cause, um, on our survey at the end, you can feel free to notify us that you're interested uh, in learning more, or you can utilize the link here um, and sign up for a demo. All right, so let's get into the tips, what we're all here for. So the first thing we're gonna be talking about is utilizing AI. Uh, that's probably one of the biggest uh, hot topic keywords that you've heard in general, not even in the nonprofit fundraising space. So I'm gonna be talking about a little bit about AI and what is it and how can nonprofits actually utilize it? All right, so what is actually AI or artificial intelligence? So AI is a type of computer science focused on building smarter machines that can perform tasks that you would typically require human thought. It's intended to help people streamline activities that would otherwise eat up your time. Um, so this can mean helping execute strategies, data, et cetera. Um, artificial intelligence in general is a pretty broad term for a large science, um, but in general, it deals with intelligent machines. Um, some terms that you may hear surrounding AI and artificial intelligence are machine learning, which is a subfield of AI, and that specifically focuses on pattern recognition and data. So what machine learning does is it's looking for patterns within data and then using that information um, for, for new observations. Generative AI um, is a type of artificial intelligence focused on creating models with the ability to produce content. So ChatGPT is an example of that, which we'll get into in a second. In a second. So it's taking data and then using machine learning algorithms to understand and see those patterns and then formulate an output. And then large language uh, module, models are uh, essentially the text form of that. Um, it uses something called natural language processing. So it's to understand um, and generate human-like text-based content and response. So also ChatGPT, which we'll talk about. So just wanna uh, 
share those terms because you may see that as you read and learn about AI. So why use AI? Why is it such a hot button topic? Why should nonprofits be interested in utilizing AI or learning more about it? So last year, a study by Stanford University and the National Bureau of Economic Research found that AI increased workers' productivity by 14%. And actually last March, MIT researchers specifically found that ChatGPT improved workers' efficiency by 37%. So especially when we're talking about small to medium nonprofits, when you're lacking resources, this can be really helpful in your day-to-day -day tasks um, and also year-round operations. So AI can, for your nonprofit, streamline your operations, save you and your team time, it can also provide you valuable insights. And so overall help reduce the cost of fundraising by saving you time. So AI can do a couple of different things. Not everyone is going to use AI in the same way, but if we're just talking about overall, what can AI do and what can it do for nonprofits? So AI can um, data analyze. It can analyze large data sets to derive insights. So it can help nonprofits make informed decisions so that they can you know, make the right strategies. It can help optimize um, any repetitive tasks you have. So you can focus more on your core mission and less time on certain administrative tasks. It can provide predictive analytics. So it can help you see trends, predict outcomes so that you can plan more effectively and allocate your resources efficiently. And also it can provide personalization. So it can enhance your donor engagement um, by enabling like personalized communication, which we'll show in a second. So a couple of just two examples of nonprofits using AI, again, more in a broader way, not that every nonprofit here is going to be using AI in this way, but just to show you an example of how nonprofits are using artificial intelligence in their organizations. Uh, so the Trevor Project worked with Google.org and they built a chat bot to train volunteers in AI to identify high risk young people through their chats. Um, and put them through to a volunteer if it recognized it as crisis support. So that's an example of how AI is being implemented with an organization. With the Greater DC Diaper Bank, they used machine learning um, with IBM. So they designed it with IBM to scrape, organize anonymous data from governmental um, benefit rosters, local tax codes, um, internal distribution data um, to predict areas with the highest diaper needs. And so this model helped them identify neighborhoods where uh, they had fallen short and find new distribution patterns and help bring more attention to diaper shortages. So again, another example of how organizations are using artificial intelligence within their organization. These organizations obviously used with, it worked with Google and IBM, and not every nonprofit here is going to be doing that. So how can you implement AI in your day-to-day -day roles and tasks? So ChatGPT uh, is a really great tool, an example of something you can utilize day-to-day -day for your tasks. Um, so ChatGPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. We talked about generative AI a couple slides ago. Um, and that just really refers to how ChatGPT requests and formulates responses. Um, so ChatGPT is um, tries to understand the context of your input. It's an AI chatbot, and it replicates human-like text conversation and understanding in order to answer questions and perform any tasks using data in the internet. Um, so it's a learned knowledge to gen generate a, a relevant or a coherent response to you. Something to know about ChatGPT and to be cognizant of as you are using it is that it doesn't have access to real-time information. It relies on what it has learned up to its last training update. So ChatGPT has two uh, options. So they have ChatGPT 3.5 and ChatGPT 4.0. 3.5 is the free version. You can sign up today and start utilizing it. Um, that knowledge cutoff is January, 2022. 
So if you are, you know, looking or getting stats or something, and there was a study that just recently came out, just be aware that ChatGPT is not going to have that information um, because that information only goes up to January 2022. For uh, ChatGPT 4.0, that's their paid subscription. Um, and that knowledge cutoff is April 2023. So you're going to get more relevant, um, more current information. Um, but overall, what ChatGPT is trying to do, it's it's getting trained through human feedback. So the more you interact with it, the more that you're teaching it what you want, what you need it to do, it's learning from you and it's improving its future responses. Um, as we mentioned also a couple slides back, ChatGPT, it's, it's a language language model. So it's processing your natural language inputs and trying to predict what the next word is. Um, so it doesn't have a consciousness or a true understanding. It's predicting what's what what you think what the text will be, if that makes sense. So how can you leverage ChatGPT? So there are a couple of different ways of how you can utilize ChatGPT. So you can utilize ChatGPT um, to create social media posts, uh, to draft uh, emails or newsletters to create um, outlines for blog posts or newsletters, uh, draft grant proposals, uh, create job descriptions for an op open position you may have, um, to draft press releases, uh, brainstorm fundraising ideas, draft donor appeal letters, uh, create donor surveys. Uh, the, really, the world is your oyster in terms of what you can create through ChatGPT. So as you saw in the screenshot, sh screenshot back, as you see here, I kind of wrote uh, a prompt as to what I was looking for ChatGPT to uh, perform. So when writing your prompt in ChatGPT, um, as you start utilizing it, you'll notice that um, there's a couple of tricks that are helpful in terms of um, asking the right question to get the input that you want. Um, so one, in terms of when you're writing your chat GPT prompt writing, um, start simple. So you want to have a, a simple prompt. So as you saw in the exa a previous example, write a donor appeal. Um, and you want your call to action to be very specific. You don't have to include, um, you know, can you, please, et cetera. You can be direct and say, write, create, summarize. Um, Adding context is helpful because then it will allow your uh, response from ChatGPT to be more specific to what you're looking for. And I'll show you an example in a second. And as well, adding expectations so that you can um, sh tell a ChatGPT exactly what you want. So do you want two, if you're writing, if you're asking for a donor appeal email, do you want two paragraphs? You want two sentences? Being clear as to your expectations of what you're looking for um, will help you get the response that you want. So just a couple of ChatGPT prompts that you can utilize or you can just kind of um, get inspired by. So I have my nonprofit, include your nonprofit name. Our mission is including your mission statement. We are currently raising funds for, you can include a sentence of your campaign. Our goal is, let's say $2,000, write a donor-centric fundraising letter about, including your name again, highlight that donations will go toward, and then you can include the specific where your donation's going toward. Um, write a compelling email to, let's say, churn donors or donors that uh, have not donated this year but donated the prior year, asking for a donation of you know, $20, this person or these people are driven by, let's say they're your volunteers volunteering or they're specifically associated to specific program or cause, you can write those key drivers here so that they can be included in your response. Here's a list of our last 10 email subject lines we have used, generate 10 new ones, create a donor survey to gather feedback on our recent fundraising campaign and understand their preferences for future communication. Write a medium length social media caption for a post and include three relevant hashtags. So again, these are just examples of some prompts that you can use or you can um, start with as you utilize ChatGPT. Some really important things to know about using ChatGPT. Do not provide sensitive donor data. Um, 
ChatGPT works via web scraping. So what it's doing is it's looking at various sources on the internet, um, its own database, et cetera, to pull information. So if you are providing donor data, sensitive donor data to ChatGPT, they are holding that information in their database. So you do not want to provide any important donor data relevant to a donor in there. Um, if you as well have any proprietary information or you have any other information that you don't want ChatGPT to have access in their database for whatever reason, um, you can you should consider toggling off um, chat history and training in, in their settings. Um, it's an easy switch off and uh, your history won't be saved in ChatGPT. Do not just copy and paste. I look at ChatGPT as a great starting off point. Um, as you use ChatGPT, you'll notice that some of the language that it gives out is does not sound the most human, right? Um, and so I look at ChatGPT as a, a point of if I'm having a, a writing block, um, if I'm not sure of how to format something, right? It's a great way just to start off um, an email, again, a post, and then editing it um, with making sure that it sounds like it's coming from you and that it's personalized, et cetera. So I definitely recommend do not just copying and pasting it. As well, ChatGPT is not fact. Um, so um, as I mentioned, um, ChatGPT scrapes information from the internet, et cetera, just because it puts out information does not mean that it is correct. Um, researchers actually call um, this hallucinations. Um, and it means that ChatGPT will provide a response that seems accurate, but it is inaccurate. So if you're getting any data from ChatGPT, let's say you're saying, um, you know, can you break down um, deforestation for children, which is a great prompt to write. Um, any facts in there, I would always double check to see if they're correct and accurate. Again, it's a good starting off point, not to just copy and paste. As well as something to consider with ChatGPT and in general with generative AI is potential biases in the data. Um, that's There have been ethical questions about ChatGPT and its complexities and how it takes information. So in addition to the internet, it's taking information from Wikipedia, from Twitter to Reddit, and some of the data that's included in there is might be overrepresented, inaccurate. Um, so there could be biases um, within some of the data that it provides. So something to be cognizant of, again, as you utilize the tool. A helpful resource if you're interested in utilizing ChatGPT more is Giving Tuesday has a really great um, AI working group where they've kind of put together different case studies surrounding AI, um, data sets, et cetera. Um, so I definitely recommend checking it out if you're interested in seeing how other nonprofits are using AI or you're planning on utilizing it as well. All right, moving on to tip number two focusing on recurring giving. Uh, so uh, if we're looking at recurring giving data, according to MNR benchmarks in 2022, uh, monthly giving increased by 11% and accounted for 28% of all online revenue. Um, and as well, according to Datero fundraising benchmark report in 2023, it revealed that organizations who grew recurring, recurring giving um, income in 2022 outperformed others without a robust recurring giving program. And when just looking at our own data at Mighty Cause in regards to recurring giving, um, we noticed that in 2022, the average per transaction recurring gift was $44.68. And that increased to $48.89 in 2023. So it increased by 9.4% um, within the year. And as well, we saw over 11,000 new recurring donations were initiated across our platform in 2023. So with all of this data, I think it's important um, to recognize that recurring giving can make a major impact um, for your organization. So why does it recurring giving work outside of just those stats that I provided? 
So recurring giving is a predictable source of revenue for your organization, right? You don't have to, you're not, it, it's something that you know will be there in three months and four months and five months. Um, so it can help cover any unexpected costs that you may retain. If you're planning on a fundraising campaign and you're trying to figure out your budget, you know if you have recurring donors that you have funding coming in. Um, also, um, in a 2017 um, Target Analytics um, benchmark study, it found that recurring giving, um, that recurring donors were worth more than um, four times more than those of one-time donors over the life of their giving. So recurring donors are higher, have a higher lifetime value than just new or one-time donors. Um, and in general, recurring donors, they become actively invested in your work, right? They're making an impact every month for your organization. Um, and it's a stewardship opportunity as well that can deepen your relationship um, with your major um, donors, your board of directors, volunteers, et cetera. So what's the benefit for donors? Why would a donor want to start a recurring gift for your organization? So one, in terms of affordability, donors can stretch their giving across the year. So instead of giving $1,000 right now, they can spread it out throughout the year so that it's less burdensome financially. It is a predictable um, donation that they are making every month, right? So they can give the amount that they want and the dates that's convenient for them. And as well with flexibility on Mighty Cause, they can adjust their donation at any time, they can cancel it, they can adjust the dates, all of that is available for them. So there's a lot of flexibility for them to set it up however they want or edit it however they want. Um, but as well, you know, uh, with for donors, this is their opportunity to contribute to the longevity of your organization. So as I mentioned, another stewardship opportunity for them to support your organization um, in a sustainable way and to give long-term impact um, and also to be part of a, a community of, of donors as well. So the one way to incorporate recurring giving in 2024 is to create donation tiers and to kind of and create a recurring giving campaign. Um, so you can do this two ways. So one, you can offer suggested donation amounts that emphasize your impact. Um, so I always recommend including donation descriptions that, as I said, emphasize your impact, that really show donors why they're donating, what the impact will be. So in this example, if I donate $25 a month, I am providing one month of flea and tick medication. Um, I am, if I donate $50, I'm donating one month of animal food. And you can switch this for another organization. I'm sponsoring, you know, a, a book for a child in need the list goes on um, because that really kind of illustrates um, for the donor the impact that they're making on a monthly basis and on an annual basis. And it also provides you the ability to tell a story um, to the donor, right? At the end of the year, you help support, you know, you had 12 dogs become vaccinated because of the support that you gave. Um, and Additionally, it also, when you are descriptive about where exactly donations are going to and the impact it's making, it also encourages donors to give even more, right? Maybe I came in and just thinking I was gonna make $5, but I see, oh, if I make $50, I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna donate a, a month of animal food. Um, so I actually, I'm gonna do that because I know it's gonna make a huge impact. And I know that from the, the, the description you provided. You can also create de um, donation tiers by providing um, recognition. So you can designate certain names. So maybe $100 a month, they are a superstar or a hero. And then you can include this language in your newsletters, on your website, in your social media. You can highlight some of these donors. Again, your nonprofit heroes, et cetera. So when you are putting together a recurring giving campaign or you want to emphasize recurring giving, you want to make sure that it is super easy and um, very transparent how donors are giving and where they can go. Um, so some nonprofits on our platform, they create dedicated fundraising pages 
or you can create an area on your website that's specifically dedicated to um, recurring giving. So again, emphasizing the impact, sharing those donation amounts, how much, how far their donation can go. Um, on the Mighty Cause platform, um, on our donation form, you can actually set your uh, checkout to immediately default to monthly giving. So if you do have a monthly giving campaign that you're planning, you can set that as a default so that if donors go to it, that's immediately defaulted. They don't have to click anything and it's super easy and streamlined for them. So when you're looking um, to grow your recurring giving, um, you wanna think about targeting your existing donors. One of the best way to secure like new monthly donors is asking existing donors to deepen their commitment and relationship with your organization. Um, because these past one-time donors or people, um, they are familiar with your organization. Um, they know your mission and your impact. And so they're more likely to give and, and support your organization. So some segments that you may want to consider targeting are one-time donors whose donation may fall within a specific range, um, depending again on what your goals are and what you're trying to accomplish. Annual donors who have given for a certain number of years. Um, annual donors whose giving anniversary is coming up. Maybe this is their fifth year giving, um, et cetera. And newer recent donors. Like this is the time to engage with some new donors that you've received. Um, and retain them to be recurring donors. Um, one thing that's also available on our platform is a recurring donation report. Um, so this report allows you to manage your recurring donors. So you can see how many are active, how many have canceled, or how many are pending to be canceled. For example, if there's, you know, if their credit card is expiring, um, you'll be notified here and you can keep track of all of that information here. So that if you do want to reach out to a donor or you want to, you know, um, be reminded how many recurring donors, who should I reach out to, you know, during this time of year, et cetera, you can always come here and download a report of all of your recurring donors. All right, tip number three, engaging younger donors. I'm going to take a pause here just because we're kind of in the halfway point and I'm going to just go through some questions. Um, our group is primarily between 50 to 70 years old. How do we find a connect with younger donors? I'm actually going to talk about that in a second. So that's a perfect question. What are the images in the lower right corner? Uh, I might have missed that. Um, if you could specify exactly what slide deck I can, or what slide I can clarify. Hello. Thanks for the beautiful image. Uh, okay. Uh, still waiting to learn something not everybody knows already. Okay, if you, if there are any specific questions or anything, um, feel free to, yeah, answer, put that into the questions and I'm more than happy to get specific about something. Um, and after this webinar, I will be um, providing the slide deck and a recording of this webinar to everyone. So um, you'll have access to this. All right, engage younger donors. All right, so why focus on younger donors? It's a good question, right? Um, so I found this really interesting. An online survey of more than 2,000 US adults um, conducted by Vanguard Charitable and the Harris Poll found that three in five millennials and Gen Z donors, so 60%, say they're likely to give more to charity over the next 12 months than in the past 12 months. And this survey was done in um, October of 2023. So this is a pretty recent survey. This is compared to only two of five Gen Xers and baby boomer, boomers. So don't only focus on older donor group. Um, in particular, there's going to be at some point a great wealth transfer ex expected in the next upcoming years. Um, so it's important now to think about how you're going to expand your donor pools. How can you focus on um, reaching to younger generations, which we'll talk about in a second. So just to also re-emphasize why it's really important to reach out to younger donors, I also thought this was a really interesting um, report, was that Morning Consult report on trust in brands found that 
millennials trust in nonprofits was the highest of any age group in growing. And actually for boomers, it was the opposite. It was their trust in nonprofits was decreasing. So across generational cohorts, millennials saw the most year over year growth across donation categories. So this meant donating blood, donating time, donating goods, et cetera. So there is a huge demographic of donors that you may not be reaching out to yet. So, um, and as well, something to also think about when talking to or thinking about reaching out to younger generations is that younger generations are used to giving online. Um, according to Forbes, nearly half of Gen Z donors have, uh, have already given to an individual personal cause, like a GoFundMe. So the act of giving online, the act of donating, they're already used to. It's, it's already common within their culture. So how to win over younger donors? How can you reach out to this new demographic if it's new to you? Um, so younger generations are driven by cause, not organization, right? They're driven by um, your mission. So they're not as interested in the name of your organization, um, you know, the Mighty Cause Foundation, whatever that means. They're more interested in what is the exact work that you do and the impact that you make in your community. Um, so build meaningful relationships based on trust. Um, nonprofits, you need to show the impact that you're making and why your gifts matter. Um, as well, build events for rapid response. Um, Gen Z and millennials are 1.6 times more likely and motivated to donate after a news event or crisis. So if there is at any point, um, and the commission but you make sure it is as um statistics they will respond more to the impact that you're making your call your mission that that's very clear and that you have a clear area of your website that says speaks to that is important to reaching out to younger gen, um, generations. And as well, um, it doesn't just have to be younger donors, right? So as I mentioned before with the morning consult, they found that millennials were also um, more involved with giving time, giving goods, et cetera. So this is also an opportunity to um, in regards to stewardship of creating volunteer participation opportunities. Um, so what, if there are any volunteer opportunities available, maybe use volunteermatch.org and share that. Um, that's another way of reaching out to younger demographics. Um, okay, thank you for telling me um, it's freezing up. Um, how is it now? Perfect. All right. Thank you. All right. Sorry about that. And if there's a um, art. And again. Okay, is it still freezing? Okay, I'm gonna continue on. I apologize. Um, like I said, this is being recorded. So if there's any issues, uh, the recording will be provided, I'm sorry. Don't wanna go offline um, and, and uh, stop the webinar, but. All right, um, embrace storytelling. Um, so why do stories matter? Why is it important to focus in 2024? 
Um, so stories have the ability to humanize the impact of owner's gift. Um, so it's gonna resonate them on a personal level. Um, storytelling can help cut through the clutter of all the do other donation appeals, other marketing appeals that donors or supporters receive and help you stick out, right? It's telling your story, um, going back to how to appeal to younger donors or recurring donors, it's telling your story. Um, and when thinking about telling your story, you wanna mix statistics and facts um, to make a large impact. Um, because that's really going to paint the picture to your supporters um, about your organization. So when talking about impact stories, um, an impact story is a framing device used where you can use a story of an individual or a group your nonprofit has served to demonstrate the kind of work your organization does. Um, so impact stories, why they're so powerful is that it shows, not tells donors what you do. They create an emotional connection with owners and that typically drives donations then. Um, and through emotional storytelling and compelling characters, they can understand again, what is the problem that your organization is trying to solve for. It shows donors their return on investment, right? A compelling story can showcase the impact that their donation can make. Um, So when thinking about an impact story, how to tell your um, think about a story that accurately illustrates your work. If you're telling a story that is an outlier in the type of work your nonprofit does, you're telling a strong impact story. And make sure that it kind of goes back into what your organization does, your mission, right? It shouldn't be too tangential. Um, making it multimedia. So in order to have an emotional connection, video and and photos um, is a great way to make it even more powerful. Um, and of course, if you are focusing on a specific individual or group of people, um, confirming with them that they, um, you know, you have permission to share their story is also, I think, typically just a good ethical um, check-in that you can share with people their story. So I have an example of um, an organization on our platform. I thought it was a really great example of how they were sharing their impact with using stati st statistics, but also with multimedia. Um, so on the left side, you see on their page, they have statistics outlining one in six children who are not reading professionally by um, third grade, do not graduate from high school. More than 60% of American fourth graders are not proficient readers. So they have the stats related to the problem that they're trying to solve. And then I'm gonna play this video. Oh, one second. Let me know if you cannot hear this. We invited the Literacy Matters Foundation Mighty Doodle program in because we saw falling test scores in reading, particularly in grades K through four. And we knew if they didn't have the foundational skills to read, they would never be reading to learn by fourth grade. We love Mighty Doodle. Not only do the scholars love the games and the avatar and all the things that they're learning, uh, we as teachers love it for the data and the ability to take what we're learning from Mighty Doodle and implement even more instruction in the classroom. Since the Mighty Doodle program has come to St. John Paul II, our scholars are meeting and exceeding their growth scores in reading. But most importantly, they love to read. There is nothing like Mighty Doodle on any other platform. It truly focuses in on the most essential skills for foundational reading. So if your school is struggling with foundational skills, the Mighty Doodle program is for you. So I thought that was a great example of how they combine the two. Um, and again, not everyone is going to be able to create a video like this and that's totally okay. But you can use this as an example of how you can create a testimonial, how you can have um, people that have been impacted by your organization, organization share their story. And that can be in an email, that can be in an image, that can be 
in a, in a fundraising page. Um, that can be in a lot of different ways. It doesn't have to just be media, but uh, in a video, but as you see, that's an easy way of how to All right, and the last tip is fostering donor relationships. So, uh, spreading, oh, I'm sorry, I see my connection is unstable, so I apologize, um, but we're almost finished. Um, so your bond with your donors is the lifeline of your organization. So I think it's really important to make a concerted effort to nurture these relationships. Um, so individuals give where they feel the greatest connection. So once a donor gives, making sure that you're engaging with new donors, acknowledging their contributions, sharing tangible impacts of their gifts is really important, again, to steward them to become a recurring donor, um, to become a volunteer, to become a future board member, um, et cetera. So cultivating meaningful donor relationships is really important um, for engaging and stewarding new donors. Um, and without a process for stewarding, um, you can have, um, you know, attrition, um, you can not have those donors come back and become recurring donors again. So donation, nonprofits have a continuing ongoing relationship with donors. It's not just a series of actions, it's a reciprocal relationship. Again, donors are donating because they think they're going to be making an impact, right? Good. They're they're knowing that there's a change or there's in some sort of way. So building donor relationships and moving donors down your pipeline to increase their investment and investment in your work is essential for funding and future growth. Donors want more than just a receipt. They want to get involved with your cause, right? They they give because they care and in return they want to know that you see them that their gift is actually doing good and making an impact and that you know the donation that they made whether it's five dollars or a thousand dollars is important and has made a difference so so some stewarding solutions to consider um implementing this year so building an onboarding plan so how are you welcoming new donors do you have an automatic email that's going out to a new donor um, if it's a large donor, are you giving them a call? Do you have, what information are you providing new donors? Um, think about an onboarding plan for new donors. What call to action do you want to provide them? Do you want to ask them to involve, come volunteer, share information, continue an impact story to share a story if they're supporting, you know, an animal, et cetera. Make use of also a CRM. This is a really helpful way with stewarding donors. Um, at Mighty Cause, we have our supporters tool, which is our solution to as our donor management system. Um, we also have an integration with Salesforce and Zapier um, so that you can make um, stewarding really easy, all of your donors going into your CRM system so you can keep track of all of that information in one place. And building gratitude um, in your day-to-day -day operations. So including it in your email and newsletters because of you including that type of language, um, your support, et cetera. Um, so some other stewarding solutions available. So creating an annual report. So create a culture of accountability with donors, put together you know, a report each year to report on your success and all the cool things donors enabled you to do. Again, showing that information, showing that impact of your nonprofit. Um, planning out a communication plan um, of what is your reach out to new donors or um, past donors. Um, and as well, coming up with ways of recognizing donors. We talked about creating donation tiers. So having, you know, they donate $75, they're a hero, et cetera. How can you express gratitude to your donors? Um, and making donor engagement a top priority. So um, it's essential to kind of keep this in line with your work and making sure that you're actively working to have donors retained and engaged with your nonprofit. All right, so we're at the end of our webinar. We'll go second. Um, we have our support site. Our
keep an eye on upcoming our blog has um, that we talked about. So, all right, questions. Um, and as I mentioned, I will be um, sending over the slide deck um, and a recording after this. So let's talk about this. Um, okay, so if younger donors prefer online donations, does that mean they prefer online thank you letters or does an actual note stand out because it is unusual? That is a really great question. Um, I believe there was a study and I can't pinpoint what the findings were on it of this, that specific question. Um, but I, I do think it is a bit dependent on your organization and, and your budget and direct appeals. Um, if your organization has been doing direct appeals, I still think it's worthwhile to send out direct appeals because I do think it is a unique thing. And I do think it's actually something that does stand out. And that just because younger generations are online, are online does not mean that they, you know, don't receive mail or, or you know, are interested or, you know, in, in direct um, mail appeals. Um, so I think if you've been using online thank you letters, I think that's perfectly fine. But if you have been utilizing direct mail appeals, I think it's definitely still helpful to utilize that um, for younger donors. And again, I think the important thing is to also think about what are you including in that direct mail appeal like we talked about? Are you emphasizing the impact that the gift is making, um, you know, where their donation is going, et cetera? Um, how do I start using ChatGPT? Is there a website? So yeah, um, so the website for ChatGPT is, it is openai or chat.openai.com. So, and if you Google ChatGPT, it will also come up, but chat.openai.com. Okay, uh, I'm just looking at the chat as well. Um, customer, uh, what is CRM? Um, CRM, customer relationship management. So, um, you know, it's where you can basically manage all donors. So basically you can keep track of all of the active donor and their activities. So how many times they donated, how many times, um, you spoke to them over the phone, um, you reached out to them um, so that, again, you can keep track of, uh, you know, who you need to reach out to and um, how responsive they are, et cetera. I don't see any other questions coming in. So yes, as I mentioned, I'll be sending a recording over um, and as well as the slide deck um, that will be sent out probably tomorrow. Uh, I can, here I can post uh, the link to open chat here. Uh, and if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to our support team as well. Um, my name is Lisa. Um, thank you guys so much for coming 